Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? How are things? How are things going out there in fishing land? I hope somebody's catching fish because I'm not. Vermont fishing is um, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. It's it's interesting that um, there are many places in the country where you can catch trout when the water is 42, 43 degrees um, with fair regularity. And it just doesn't happen um, in our Vermont streams, our freestone streams. And it may be because they're freestone and um, the fish don't seem to be acclimated to those lower water temperatures. And it's been really, really tough. We've even had hatches, um, Hendrickson hatches with no fish coming up because the water's in, in the 40s. So um, I don't quite, I don't quite understand it, but it's, it's seldom, uh, seldom very productive here. And I'm sure there's other parts of the country where until the water temps warm up to uh, 50 degrees or so, things don't, things don't get going. Um, and it may be because there's just no insects out in the water column and the fish have no reason to be out in the open. They're, they're hiding from predators and not doing much else, but, um, but it's been very tough here. So we're looking forward to warmer weather someday. Um, could use a little rain too. So I hope, Oh, Ed says it's 86 in central Florida. Well, Ed, you probably got something biting down there then because we sure don't up here. I, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go to Florida right now or Austin, Texas, or even Altoona, Pennsylvania to fish with Scott. Um, Jackson, Mississippi, Chile, Jackson, Mississippi, William, come on. You don't know Chile in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes. Uh, we started a little early until, um, until we get, ah, Windy Wellington, New Zealand. Warren's in Windy Wellington, and it's winter down there, right? Or it's coming into winter there, so you're going to get cold. Um, Jeff, has, Jeff has had success with scuds on local tailwaters around grass beds. Yep, yep, and we're going to talk about scuds. In fact, um, in fact, we're not... We're going to talk about uh, about fishing these flies a little bit before we even get into the tying. It's not a terribly complicated pattern. It's it's got some tricks to it, like like most of them do. But I thought that you know, um, going forward, we should do more talking about fishing each pattern if it has some specific uh, fishing application. If it's not just a standard nymph and and scud imitations. Um, do have specific applications you're not going to uh, you're not going to find them everywhere and uh, so we're going to talk about uh, where to find them and what time of day to fish them how to fish them and so on and i'll show you uh, a couple pictures of the um of the bugs as soon as uh, as soon as we get get going a little bit here. So March Browns are starting on Pence Creek. Wow, you guys are way ahead of us. Broken Bow, Oklahoma, 79 degrees. That's almost too hot for trout fishing. Mm. Saratoga Springs, Ed. You know what it's like around here right now. Hope you're catching fish over at Saratoga Springs because over in Vermont, things aren't, things aren't very... Uh, Things aren't very hopping. Uh, Driftless area, Thomas, uh, I don't know if you're asking about it, but I just had a report that the Driftless area is on fire. Fishing is good there. Um, so Dan says, your stonefly advice led to some larger trout on the Farmington this month. Not big numbers, but some in 18 to 20. Whoa, that's not, that's not big. It's big in my book. That's big. That's really big in my book. Scuds are deadly on Spring Creek and State College. Yep, that's that's um, sure the case. And scuds in the driftless. Um, yep, any place you have. So let's talk about scuds. Um, scuds are a um, are a freshwater crustacean. And let me share my screen with you here. I'm gonna open up. Uh, 
I'm going to open up a, a few images here. So um, scuds are freshwater crustaceans, and uh, this is what they look like. And they range from a, oh, a size 12 down to a, oh, a size 18 or 20, fairly small. And they're multi-brooded, so they, they have a bunch of broods during the year. And being crustaceans, unlike, um, unlike aquatic insects, they don't hatch out of the river. They're always there year-round, winter, spring, summer, fall. They're always, they're always there because they're, they're totally aquatic. And um, there's, there's scuds, which, uh, which this shows you, which are um, kind of laterally uh, compressed. And um, they, they scurry around in the weeds. They're not really strong swimmers, but they do scurry around in the weeds. And um, it's interesting that where you find scuds, you find really colorful brown trout uh, or brook trout or rainbow trout. But um, scuds tend to give these fish um, brilliant colors on the outside. And then the flesh is typically going to be very pink. If you eat a fish, it's going to be almost as pink as a salmon inside. So um, fish pick up this coloration from their diet, from a diet of could be scuds, sow bugs, or even crayfish will do this. But the, the trout are the trout are usually really beautifully marked and um, really brilliant where you find um, scuds in the water. This is a um, this is a shot of a, uh, the stomach contents from that little fish that you just saw, and you can see there is a, in the upper uh, left is a is a fresh scud. Those two scuds on the bottom that look kind of pinkish orange, uh, that's because they're dead. And um, they, um, they turn pink or orange uh, because of the stomach acids in a trout. They're being cooked, basically, like a, like a cooked shrimp or a lobster. And um, people, use, uh, people use pink shrimp and orange shrimp. You can tie these in pink and orange, and they seem to work fairly well. And I don't know if the pink shrimp originally uh, got started because somebody cut open a trout and saw these pink shrimp inside it and decided to imitate them, or they're actually imitating a dead scud. But the scuds do, um, particularly in tailwaters, they get washed out of a reservoir and they will, um, they'll die and they'll turn pink and they drift in the current. And fish will pick these up. And in the very center of this uh, stomach contents there, you'll see a sow bug. Sow bugs are um, just usually just a little bit bigger than the scuds. And they're flattened uh, dorsally, so they're um, they're more flat, flattish like a stonefly nymph, whereas the scuds are are flattened uh, laterally. And uh, you find these critters in waters, typically waters that have a lot of weed, uh, but the water has to have some degree of alkalinity. Uh, the pH is usually going to be above neutral, above seven. And there's going to be a high concentration of uh, calcium bicarbonate in the water. So think limestone, limestone areas, areas where you have limestone bedrock, uh, because the, the crustaceans need calcium to build their shells. So you're going to find these things living in the weeds um, in, in a stream, um, you know, the spring-fed or tailwaters. Tailwaters have uh, abundant scuds because they usually have a lot of aquatic vegetation, they usually have a fairly high calcium bicarbonate count, and and they're very stable. So the scuds, uh, you'll you'll find that you won't find the scuds usually in Rocky Mountain streams or in real acidic freestone streams, um, but you you will find them in, in tailwaters and spring creeks and limestone streams. So that's where you're going to look for them. And it's funny um, that uh, these things. These things are, are all over the place. I mean, they're, they're always there. They're always there. They're not, not just hatching, but they're always in the water. But um, the fish, you could fish a scud in a stream that's rich with scuds some days and not catch anything. Some days they'll be on them, and some days they won't. And um, I'm not sure exactly why or when, but I do know that uh, first thing in the morning is a really good time, and I caught this. I caught this fish. This isn't a fish somebody's playing. He's actually turning on his side 
to stir up some scuds. And, and what you'll see is you'll see um, the fish move into really shallow uh, weed bed areas in the morning and they'll dig and they'll root in the weeds and shake the weeds and then they'll back up and let the scuds drift into them and then they'll they'll pick up the scuds and and i've i've seen it most often in the morning and in shallow water and i think the fish move into shallow water because um the drift is compressed there the, the you know if a fish is doing this in in three feet of water the scuds could go all over the place but if a fish is doing this in shallow water um the scuds that it dislodges have a very narrow drift window so that it's easier for the fish to pick them up so Anyway, um, that is a little bit of um, fishing with uh, with scuds, and let's see if we have some questions here about uh, about scuds. Uh, funny you say that. I took a stalker to eat last year in a mountain stream in Arizona. I never thought to use scuds, but belly was full of little olive scuds. Just enough slow water in the pools to have weeds and scuds. Always keep a few in my box. Yeah, Ben, um, I, I suspect that that mountain stream um, probably ran through some some limestone bedrock as well. And uh, you know, typically you don't find a lot of calcium and, and uh, a lot of scuds in mountain streams, but you never know. And if if you do see weed beds, it's definitely worth um, worth trying a scud. And um, these things can be fished in you know, sizes 12 through, through 18, they're a little bit tough to tie in an 18. Um, they'll be, they'll occur in all sizes. I have my best luck with a 14 and 16, uh, when I'm fishing scuds, but it doesn't really matter because, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be all sizes, um, all sizes of, uh, of scuds in the water because the, of the multi generations, but 14, 16, um, you know, they, they, they uh, hit the water a little lighter uh, and um, they're a little more subtle. I think sometimes smaller flies are less suspicious to the fish. And often these you're fishing these scud patterns in heavily fished streams. So, um, and yes, Jim, they are in ponds and lakes, um, very abundant in ponds and lakes, especially where the water is a little on the alkaline side. So yes, uh, good, good pattern for uh, fishing in ponds and lakes with a very slow strip <clears throat> or just uh, hanging them from a, from a strike indicator, a bobber on a dead drift because they don't swim very fast. So you don't want to, you don't want to move them very fast. Um, let's see. Is it true you caught bonefish fishing scuds in Mexico? Henry, Henry Cowan. Oh, Henry Cowan. Jeez. No, Henry, I've never fished in Mexico and I've never caught a bonefish on a scud. Henry's a, Henry's a buddy of mine. So he's, uh, he's in here giving me grief, but that's okay. Henry, you can do that. Um, not much, not so much a scuds more tied to look like sand fleas. Okay. Here's what, um, here's what the scud we're going to, tie today looks like and it's it's called a bead body scud so it has a bead in it to help sink it and i'm going to tie it a little bit different than uh you see it in the orvis catalog uh they put a tail on on the commercial fly i'm not going to put a tail on mine because i think it retards the sink rate i don't think you need a tail on a scud scuds don't have tails they have little flippers at the end but um uh, they're not they're not very prominent so i leave the tails off and um, I also put a coat of UV resin on top of it uh, to make it look a little more translucent and also to, uh, to, help, it, to help it sink a little bit. So anyway, um, that is, uh, that is and, and you want to fish your scuds dead drift. Uh, they don't swim very well. And, you know, especially if you're fishing a pink or an orange one, because that's imitating a dead one. So you want to fish them dead drift. Um, you might try an occasional twitch or lift just a little bit, uh, but you don't, you don't want to give them very much uh, action. You want to fish at dead drift, just like you would a mayfly nymph or a midge larva or something. So, um, and some of the very best fishing is with scuds is sight fishing. You know, when you can spot a, a fish in shallow water 
and you see it shaking the weeds or you see it just kind of hanging there and feeding um, and with no indicator, no dry dropper, no split shot, no nothing, just a naked scud on the end of a long light leader, say 6X or sometimes even 7X and just pitching that fly to that fish and watching the fish's reaction. And when the fish moves, moves off to the side, when you think your fly's in the area, then you gently raise the rod tip. If the fish wasn't taking your fly, then your fly just kind of lifts away. Um, and if the fish is taking your fly, then you tighten a little bit more. So uh, it's really fun. Some of the most exciting, it's, it's every bit as exciting as uh, streamer fishing or dry fly fishing, uh, sight fishing nymphs, uh, particularly these scuds. So, um, John, you're going to Montana Bighorn in late May. Terrestrials or what would be productive? John, I would recommend that, you, first of all, you have some scuds with you. And second of all, that you talk to a fly shop or a guide in that area before you ask me. Because um, I, although I have fish the bighorn in late May, I'm not an expert on it. So you need to need to talk to the, the locals and the experts about uh, what to expect there. Then there is the Jurassic Lake Scud, which blow things out of the water. Yeah, I've never seen Jurassic Lake Warren, but I hear it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, all right, so shall we, shall we tie? Shall we tie? It's 315, let's tie a fly. Um, yeah, let's tie a fly. Let's start. Oh, I gotta turn this camera on. Here, I'll let you look at that for a minute while the camera warms up. Okay, so um, I think I told you, um, I think I told you to use Spectre Blend nymph dubbing, and, and that'll be fine. Um, I'm not sure if Orvis still sells this stuff, but uh, scud dubbing is kind of a translucent dubbing, and scuds are scuds are quite translucent, so. Um, I do, I do like to use this, but any, you know, any kind of translucent uh, dubbing or rough, rough dubbing, you want something that's fairly rough uh, because you're going to pick it out to imitate the legs on this fly. So I'm going to start with a size 14. Um, this is a, a wide gape tactical hook, so it's barbless. And I've got a small bead on there. I don't know exactly what size it is, um, but it you want the bead to be not terribly huge, uh, but you, you know, and you want to gauge the bead uh, depending on um, how deep of water you're going to fish, because um, it'll sink better if it's a bigger bead. But a bigger bead makes this fly a little bit more difficult to uh to tie so i'm gonna, I'm gonna this is about the right size so eyeball whatever hook you have and um turn the exposure up there a little bit eyeball whatever size hook you have and make it make it look about that proportion there julia you're gonna yell out questions right because i'm not looking at the screen anymore you got okay I know you guys are all happy that Julie is here today. I am too. Okay, so I'm using an olive uh, 8.0 or 12.0 thread. Uh, scuds are kind of an olivey color, uh, olivey gray. So I'm just going to start my thread behind the bead and go about halfway down the shank and cut my thread. And then I am going to take a piece of, uh, this is going to be my rib. I'm going to use uh, extra fine, extra small uh, silver altar wire. You could use anything you want for this rib. Uh, you could use gold. You could use any color you want. Uh, you use a piece of wire as fine as you can get it. And if you don't have any fine wire, some uh, six or seven X monofilament will also work just fine. 
uh, it's just to strengthen it and give it some segmentation. So whatever you whatever you have uh, to to make a nice rib will work. But I, I like this fine silver wire, and you're gonna hold that on top of the shank and just bind it. Try to keep it on the near side, and you're gonna bind it back over the bend. You're gonna go back a ways around the bend. This is this will help you get that curved shape of those scuds. And you're gonna leave it hang there. Okay. Next we're gonna we're going to um, get a piece of shellback material. And for this I'm gonna use thin skin. I like thin skin. It's very strong. It's very flexible. Um, you could you could use almost any thin, flexible material. You could probably use a piece of a baggie or something. Uh, but any you know stretchy, you could use a piece of latex. Um, thin skin is great though. And you're gonna cut yourself a strip that's about the uh, about the size of the hook gap. So I've already got this measured here. I'm just going to hand cut a piece of it. The hardest part of using thin skin is is removing that paper backing. So there's there's a paper backing on the thin skin, and you could use clear. Uh, I use in gray. You could use clear. You could use olive. You could use pink if you're tying a pink one. And I would advise you to try. Try some pink or orange ones if you got scuds in your water, because sometimes imitating that dead the color of the dead scud instead of the um, I'm gonna try the other end of this. Sometimes trying the coloration of a dead scud works better than a live one. I'm also gonna try some purple. There's no such thing as a purple scud, but I'm into purple this year. I'm experimenting with purple, and I'm going to try a purple scud. I can't get this close enough to my eyes to see it. i got to move it away from the camera here. Uh, if you've had some thin skin that's been around for a while, and this has, it tends to stick to that backing. I've had this package for years. So you're just going to peel that thin skin off it and then you're left with a piece of thin skin uh, that's clear and then you want to you want to cut an angle a point on there so that it comes to a point and I'll show you that on the other camera so I've got that Thin skin, and I, yeah, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to make one side that they aren't quite even. I'm going to make one side a little bit longer. You want to, you want, when you first start to pull the shell back over, you want to have not quite the full width of the thin skin. All right, that's better. Okay, so now the easiest, easiest way to tie this in is to come back to about the center and sneak that little point in there and just grab it with your thread with kind of a loose turn of thread until it catches. And then just stretch that thin skin ever so slightly and wind back, try to keep it centered and then go all the way back around the bend to where that rib was. So this is going to be pulled over. In the end, this is going to be pulled over the top. I got to. I notice I got to go back a little farther here. You can see why tying these in 18s is not much fun. Okay, and uh, the next thing, next thing you want to do is you want to move that bead in the center of the body, like so, and wind forward and just cross over the bead a few times just to hold it in place. 
like so. Just cross over it. Your dubbing is going to hold that bead in place once you get it in there. Uh, but I like to, I like to, uh, to get it, to get it now, get it out of the way. Now I'm going to stick this thin skin in my material clip so that it stays back there. Okay, so now we're going to form a dubbing loop. So I'm going to go back to where I started. And before I do that, I'm going to get my dubbing ready. So this is a dubbing blend that I made. And it's a, um, it's a combination of um, olive and gray and brown and tan. Because uh, the scuds in, uh, I'm actually going to fish a stream that has a lot of scuds um, in a couple of days. And um, the scuds from that stream are, are this color. And most scuds are kind of that, that olivey, olivey grayish color. So unless you're going to tie a pink one or an orange one, you want to try to get it looking natural. Um, you know, you can mix... I just I just mixed a, a couple of colors of this stuff. And then you want to pull out pull out some of this dubbing, kind of tease it out and kind of get it ready. Kind of get it roll it ever so gently until it's sort of a loose noodle with a little bit of a taper. Just like that. You're gonna and that's what you're gonna catch in your dubbing loop but you don't want this to be too neat because um you, you're going to want to pick it out to form your legs now i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna use this camera to show you the dubbing loop because it doesn't work that well on the bigger on the uh, on the close-up camera so I'm going to make a loop. Just bring my thread around. Be careful you don't hook this thread on your hook point. I do that all the time. So now I've gone over that to lock the loop into place. And then I'm going to bring my thread back to the front. Tom, we have a question from Bill. Yeah. Would you mix this dubbing like hair's ear, or would you just put it together and tear and rotate it around? Yeah, bunch? yeah, just tear and rotate. It's pretty so easy to just tear, tear and rotate it. And you probably don't want to mix it too well, you know, because this the scuds are kind of mottled. So if you you know if it's not mixed terribly well, that could still be good. So yeah, yeah, just mix it, just mix it by hand. All right, so. Now I got my fingers in the loop while we're talking here. So I'm holding that loop open and looks like it flipped on me. There we go. And then I'm going to put my dubbing spinner in there, but I'm going to keep my finger in there to keep it held open. And then I'm going to take that dubbing that I prepared that kind of rough noodle and I'm going to close it up and then pinch it and spin and then I'm going to let go with my fingers and let that so this this is so the thing doesn't go crazy and spin all around the place okay so once you have that once you have that um, noodle made I also like to brush it a little bit with a piece of Velcro or something to kind of fuzz it up a little bit more because these are kind of long fibers and they tend to, you have to be really careful that you don't score your thread, but just gently brush this to get those fibers sticking out of there because these are going to be your legs like so. All right, so let's go back to the other camera. So we're going to start winding our dubbing now.
Take a few turns until that starts to cover the shank. And then yeah, you can stroke it back a little bit if you want. It's going to look fuzzy at this point. Not supposed to look terribly neat. And then I, I like to take an extra turn or two behind the bead just to get that, that taper kind of built up. And then this is the tricky part, getting in front of that bead without binding down all your dubbing because you want some legs coming out of the front of this too. And I sometimes even will brush it a little bit here just to fuzz it up a bit very carefully. That's pretty, pretty fine thread that I'm using, so I'm being careful. And now you've got a big mess, right? A big ball. Then you tie this, tie this dubbing loop off with a couple of good tight turns and come in and cut that. Looks like hell, doesn't it? Looks awful, but that's the way you want it to look at this point. And you got, you notice I got a bunch of fuzzies in front of the eye, so you can kind of clean those up by stroking them back, and and then bind down that, bind down that uh, uh, dubbing loop a little bit more. Now make sure you leave yourself enough room at the head on this fly because you got to pull that shell back over the top and that's that's pretty bulky to tie down. So make sure that you have enough space there in the front to be able to uh, tie that stuff in. Any questions so far, Julia? Yeah, uh, no? we've got two questions. Thomas, okay. asking, would hair's mask dubbing be a bad idea in your opinion? And uh, so we'll start there. Yeah, I've been think you know I've been thinking of trying some with hair's mask, and I think I think it would work pretty well. It's not as translucent as this uh, synthetic stuff, and the scuds are quite translucent. But I, I would think hair's mask would be a, an interesting fur to use. Yeah. Great. And Roger Bird's asking, does it matter which way you spin your dubbing spinner? If you ask Tim Flagler, it matters. If you ask me, it doesn't. And I've done the research and I don't think it matters. <laughs> so there Roger, you, you spin it any damn well way you please. In fact, probably you should ask Irma which way you should spin your dubbing. Any other questions? No? Not at the moment. I'll pop in if we get another. Okay. And then, um, before you pull that shell back over, you might want to just kind of stroke those fibers down. And then you're going to pull and stretch this thin skin or whatever you decided to put over the top, a baggie over the top, and take a very loose turn so that you don't, um, you don't, if you, if you get too tight on this first turn, the stuff doesn't cinch down properly. And now tighten once you make that loose turn. Take a couple more turns, tight turns, and then pull up that thin skin. Cut it off. Give it a little stretch and cut it off. And now you can um, finish up binding down the ends of that thin skin, forming a nice little head there. Okay, so it's starting to look scuddy. And then you still got that rib hanging out in the back, that piece of wire or mono or whatever you decided to use. And kind of tricky not to kind of pull those fibers down as you come forward because they're going to get caught in that. And you can wiggle it a little bit and push them out of the way and pull them down because we're going to put some epoxy on top of this and we don't want the, the hair sticking up on top. 
and I'm going to actually pluck some of those out before we uh, before we epoxy it. And so this gives it um, more strength, and it also gives it segmentation. And then you tie off your wire. And use either wire cutters or the inside of your scissors to cut that little wire. And now you whip finish. But we're not done yet. The stuff gets all over the place, so any w really wild hairs you can get rid of. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with a dubbing needle or something, and I'm going to just get any of those fibers that got bound under pulled down. You can also pick some of that out, but we're going to pick some of that out afterwards. And then just make sure you don't have any hair sticking over the top because it just makes it difficult to uh, do your epoxy. And then, you know that extra thick UV cure epoxy you bought that you never figured out what to do with? Well, here's the place to use it. You know that thick stuff? that you never use because you can't find a use for it, this works really well here. So you're going to carefully get this started off to the side first. Carefully goop this on top. I should be using a dubbing needle here, but I'm going to I'm going to take a risk and just try to yeah, a little bit gloppy in the back. And then finally, the UV tour. And the, see, the nice thing about the thick stuff is it'll sit there on that overlay and it's not going to run down on you. And now I can take my UV torch and the thick stuff you really want to want to give it uh, you want to get really close with the light and you want to leave it there for a while because um, it's tough for the UV to penetrate through all that so um, be careful and and make sure that you give this a good dose of UV light in fact when you're done with these you might want to let them sit in the sun for a couple hours just so they get plenty of UV before you take them out and fish them. All right. And then um, the final step is you can brush those legs down. I got more in the back than I want. Brush those legs down and then cut them. You know, kind of cut them even with the hook point. Any that are sticking up on top, you can get rid of. You can pluck them too. And so there is your scud in, in underwater. This, you know, it looks like it looks like it's got a good scud shape, and it's got all those it's got all those crazy legs wiggling underneath it. And um, you know, it's a good it's a good effective pattern. I would not fish a a tailwater or a spring creek without having some scuds in my box. So that is the fly. I can see I got an air bubble in my epoxy. That uh, It's a good thing I'm not tying against Flagler today. I would be, uh, I would be disqualified. And, you know, now that I see it close up in that camera, I might come in and pull down a few more fibers in the front. Um, Tom, Bruce is asking if you can 
use UV resin or goop to be substituted for the scud back. Oh, and not and not put the scud back. Mm -hmm. I, I see. Um, you can, you can you can do that. The problem is. Um, the problem with doing that is when you try to put that resin on top on top of that fuzzy dubbing, you're not going to get that nice shape. It's going to um, it's going to it's going to you're going to get all lumps in in the ba the back of it. So uh, some sort of overlay, smooth overlay, uh, really really helps to um, to put that epoxy in place. Uh, Larry, we have two labs here, in the house. <laughs> and. There uh, is a cleanup crew doing yard cleanup outside, so they're barking at the cleanup crew. I apologize for the leaf blowers if you heard them in the background. Um, Rob, they're very prevalent in Western tailwaters, uh, scuds. Nearly every tailwater uh, has scuds because, uh, because of the rich nutrients and, and the weed beds that you're going to find in a tailwater. So, um, yeah, nearly every tailwater. Um, ever use a scud on the San Juan? I think so. It's been a long time since I fished the San Juan, but um, uh, but I probably did when I fished it, but I, I don't remember. It's it's been a long time. Um, Roger Bird, this is a freshwater shrimp. A scud is a freshwater shrimp. So that's what some people call it a freshwater shrimp. Uh, let's see what else. Scuds, it's freshwater shrimp. I think that's Gam Gamorous is uh, is the genus for this particular crustacean. You may see them called Gamorous sometime by the hoity-toity people that like to use Latin. Uh, but Gamorous, Scud, Freshwater Shrimp, same thing. And sow bug is very similar, except their sow bugs are flattened this way and scuds are flattened this way. But you could probably fish this. You know, I think the fish will take one or the other because they usually occur together. Sometimes uh, scuds are more common. Then uh, oh crest bug yes Scott crest bug is another is another word for um, for these bugs my camera's freezing let's see if I can oh there it stopped crest bugs thank you so much sow bug yep sow bug scud sow bug sow bug's different than than a scud sow bug is the it's slightly different um. Dave, you are you are very welcome. Thank you for your for your nice comments. Nobody gonna be nasty to me. Where'd Henry Cowan go? Nobody's gonna be nasty. You you guys aren't nasty. You guys you guys are you guys are too nice to me. You guys are you guys don't give me any grief except when I'm tying against Flagler. Next week. Is it is next week Flagler week, Julia? Yeah. Uh, it is next I'm not sure if you sent me the your. T your I didn't. I didn't. But next week we're tying an Adams irresistible, which Flagler is not happy about. That is <laughs> one nasty fly to tie, and it was my pick. So uh, Flagler is 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 called me evil for picking the Adams irresistible. So basically, um, it's an Adams with a deer hair body. A little tiny, a size 14 deer hair body. So this is going to be fun. A lot of, a lot of potential for screw ups on this fly. So um, yeah, it could be, it could be very, very interesting. So anyway, um, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. The this is an interesting question from Roger. Uh, how do you determine if the water is the proper pH for scuds to exist? I think that's a great question. Yeah, um, you really, I don't know if. Sometimes uh, from the USGS stations, you can find, you can get pH. Um, but uh, the best thing to do is to just um, look at the, if, if the rocks have kind of a crust on them, that's calcium carbonate that comes out of solution. If the rocks have kind of a crusty layer, um, it pr it's probably very alkaline. But the best way to find out if there's scuds in the water is to reach your hand in the water, grab a bunch of weed. You got to have weed in the water. So if there's no weed, you're probably not going to find scuds. Put your hand in the water, grab a bunch of weed, and pull it up. And if there's scuds in there, you will see them. They'll be, they'll be crawling all over the place. They're very, very abundant. So um, that's the best way. Um, you know, you can buy it. You can buy a pH meter, but I don't know if you want to spend a couple hundred bucks just to take the pH of your water. I did, but 
I'm geeky. I, that way I do that stuff. <laughs> so, um, but sometimes you can find on state websites, um, sometimes you can find the pH. Can you tie a rat face to McDougal alongside the Adams Irresistible? No, they're close enough, Bruce. We're not tying a rat face McDougal. We're just going to tie an Adams Irresistible. That's enough. That's enough. Uh, let's see. Like to run a stonefly under them. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good combo. Although it's, it's not, it's not real typical to find stoneflies and scuds in the same river. You're more likely to find scuds, scuds alongside um, midges, mayflies, or caddisflies. Stoneflies are typically in more rocky, less weedy water. I mean, you might st find stoneflies there, but if I was going to fish this uh, scud pattern with another pattern, I would probably use like a pheasant tail or some sort of... Uh, small mayfly imitation with this fly oh, or a may, or or i'd use this for my bigger fly and i'd uh you know use a zebra midge because uh, where you find scuds you're always going to find midges and probably fish feeding on midges so um i would i would fish a little midge midge nymph midge pupa with this uh roger bird pool test strips are not very accurate um they I guess they could tell you if it's what what it, what side of neutral it is, but they're they're not they're not super accurate. I've not had good luck with those test strips, but they're better than spending two hundred bucks for a pH meter. So you and Flagler should be should do the blindfold tie challenge side by side. Oh God, I have enough trouble. I have enough trouble keeping up with Flagler with. With my close-up glasses, I'm not gonna go blindfolded. Forget it, guys. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll tie a woolly bugger blindfolded sometime. Um, <laughs> that would be kind of interesting. Maybe we'll try it. Maybe we'll try it. Have you ever fished in the UK? Yes, I have, Joe. I fished the Test and the Itchin and the Piddle and the Kennet. And the Derbyshire Y, um, I love love the UK. I haven't been there in a long time, but I do enjoy UK fishing. And I've fished some reservoirs um, in the UK as well. What's your favorite fly to use, Ty? I don't have one, Brody. Um, my favorite fly uh, va varies with the day. And it's going to depend on where I am and what the water looks like and what, how I'm feeling and what fly talks to me in my fly box. I, I don't have a, I don't have a favorite. Do you fish them most of the year or certain times? Uh, Rick, they're there all the time. So um, you, you, you can fish them all year round. And like I said, it's funny that it, with uh, streams with uh, scuds, they're there all the time. But scud doesn't always work, and not sure why. Uh, but uh, I do find uh, in the morning, uh, early in the morning, before the insects are active, that the fish seem to be on scuds in the streams that I've fished. So for whatever reason, um, and if this is in lots of different streams and lots of regions where um, I found scud to be very effective in the morning. But um, they can they can work all day. Again, they're they're there, and they're there in the middle of winter. Uh, so. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be there all the time. So uh, you can fish this fly 12 months a year. Alfred, first time tying along and your fly came out great. Well, that's cool. Post it on uh, Facebook or Instagram and tag Orvis Fly Fishing. We'd love to see, we'd love to see your fly. Uh, let's see, what else? Would you fish the scud pattern in the first Connecticut River, New Hampshire? No, I would not, Brendan. I don't think that that's, uh, that's not uh, Connecticut River, uh, at least up that high, um, is uh, not very alkaline and not many weeds, maybe down lower around, uh, you know, Pittsburgh and below. Um, 
but uh, you know, the river gets wider and deeper and, and a little more weed there, but I don't think up near first Connecticut, like um, uh, that uh, scuds would be, I don't know. They might be cause it, there's a, there's a lake up there, but I, I, I wouldn't be my first choice up that way. What was the dubbing material again as I was late? It's uh, called scud dubbing, scud dub. Her, but you can use any any kind of translucent uh, buggy dubbing. It doesn't really matter. Can you fish a beadless scud downstream like you would a soft tackle? Um, <clears throat> they don't swing very well. I don't think that a scud pattern is a, is a very good swinging fly unless – Unless you tie, there's a there's one they fish, uh, scud sow. There's one with a collared hackle. I think they fish it on the bighorn. He has a white collared hackle that you might swing. But again, these things don't swim and they don't emerge uh, like mayflies and caddisflies do. So I'm not so sure that swing uh, swinging would be very effective. I mean, the fish might take it for something else, like a caddis pupa. But I don't, I think if you're imitating a scud, I don't think swinging it downstream would be the way to go. You're better off fishing it dead drift. Any other questions? Are we going to get done early today? And you could leave the bead off these. You know, if you don't want to put a bead on it, you could wrap a little non-toxic wire. You do want a little bit of weight on these flies, but if you don't want to use the bead version, then you could wrap a little um, wrap a little non toxic wire underneath the body before you tie it. Um, you could even, if you're fishing super super shallow water, you could even tie these unweighted. But that would be it. You know, if you're fishing inches of water, the fish are in really skinny, and you want it to sink slowly, that might work. But you generally want some weight on these. Uh, to use the tungsten scud bodies for tying these, or is that a no no? It's not a no-no, Dave. I just don't use them because I don't have any. But I've seen the tungsten scud bodies, and looks like an interesting idea. Who do you look up to find influence from regarding entomology and fly fishing? Oh boy, I look up to a lot of people, Brody. Um, I look there's there's so many people that I look up to that um, I mean. Nearly every one of my fishing buddies, I learned something from. So, I, I you know, I, I, I don't want to pick favorites because I'll leave somebody out. But, um, you know, guides, fishing buddies, uh, friends, I, I learned something new from. And most people fish better than I do, so I'm always learning something. Um, so I don't, I don't have any, but I don't have anybody that really stands out. Just that most people stand out. Most of my, most of the people I've fished with. Any other questions? No. Doesn't look like it. Last chance, because we're running out of questions. I'm not just going to sit here and talk. You've got to ask me some questions. Top flies for spring in Michigan. Brody, ask somebody in Michigan. Don't ask me. <laughs> Use the internet. I'm not, I'm not the person to ask, because I'm I, I'm going to tell you a bunch of flies, but I'm going to make them up because they're what I would I would fish there. So you know, woolly bugger, prince nymph, hare's ear nymph, pheasant tail, um, copper john, elk ear caddis. But that's I'm going to tell you that for everywhere because I don't I don't uh, don't know Michigan that well. Although I fish there. Uh, mice of shrimp. Robert wants to know. Mice of shrimp is, a, is another uh, crustacean that was introduced into, um, into lakes, in, into a few um, lakes in the western United States as a, as a food forage for, I think, for kokanee salmon, for landlocked kokanee salmon. And um, it wasn't very successful. They found out that um, the mice of shrimp and the kokanee didn't use the same depths at the same time. And so um, the mice of shrimp uh, didn't become a good forage for these uh, lake dwelling trout and salmon, but um, they do get washed through dams 
and usually often get killed. And then the trout sit below the uh, dams, particularly certain times of year when the mice and shrimp are, are um, in the water column that gets sucked out of the reservoir. I'm not sure when, um, but the trout get super fat and, um, and they just gorge on these things. And this would not be, mice and shrimp is a different kind of imitation. And I don't, you'll have to, you have to look that one up. I don't have a mice and shrimp imitation, but it's in a, it's in a limited number of, of lakes in the Western United States. So um, I'd advise you to maybe uh, look that up on the, on the internet, look up some, some mice and shrimp patterns. Scuds on the bat and kill. Not really, Stephen. I've seen some, but um, not enough that the fish bother with them. Would you use seals fur uh, for this? Yeah, seals fur would be great. The The synthetic that I used is um, very similar to seals fur. Seals fur is, um, is, uh, no, is illegal now to buy. Used to be able to, to buy it. Um, but if you have seals fur from, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, found it in an old uh, tying kit or something, seals fur would work just fine. Good place to stay when going to your fly school. <clears throat> Alfred, I don't know of a good place to stay because I've never stayed at a motel or a hotel in Manchester. So um, they, they do have some recommendations when you sign up for the school at various price points. Did you know that the fish in the frying pan died from high cholesterol from mice and shrimp? No. Really? I don't believe it. Would this fly work for steelhead in bigger sizes? Yeah, sure, Brian, it would. It would. Uh, there are scuds in, in the Great Lakes. If you're talking about Great Lakes steelhead, um, there are there are scuds in the Great Lakes, and I imagine the steelhead do eat them. So, um, and maybe not even necessarily bigger sizes, maybe in these smaller sizes that it could work for steelhead. Bruce is saying, yes, the fish in the frying pan died from high cholesterol from mice and shrimp. That's, the frying pan is one of the places where those mice and shrimp are abundant below the reservoir. I'd try, I'd try it. I'd try a scud for steelhead in the Great Lakes. I'd try it. Can you please show the fly again? Sure. There's the fly. Yeah. Who wants to look at my face? You probably want to look at the fly. This one came out okay. Um, but that's, um, yeah. And, you know, you can experiment. This is certainly is certainly not the only way to tie a scud. Um, the other thing that I'll do is make a, uh, a very tightly dubbed body from... Um, like uh, ultrafine dubbing or uh, Orvis dry fly dubbing, and I'll make a really tightly dubbed body, and then I'll rib it with a piece of ostrich hurl to get to get those legs. That looks pretty cool too. I think this one is uh, just as effective, and it's a little bit more um, a little bit more durable than the ostrich hurl variety. All right. I think the trout that died in the frying pan were someone's dinner. <laughs> it's the frying pan river in Colorado. Ed. <laughs> uh, this fly is a size 14 uh, that you're looking at, size 14, and it is tied on an Orvis uh, wide gape tactical hook barbless wide gate tactical hook which are great hooks they're barbless but they hold really really well they're that that little curved in spear point is an um, excellent holding hook even though they're barbless so um okay well gang i want to thank you can i take can i take the uh fly away now I want to thank you all for, um, well, I'm frozen. I want to thank you all for tuning in today and um, really appreciate all your great comments. There's some, some great questions there. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
Um, it's great to great to have these good questions. I hope I answered some of your questions about about tying scuds and about fishing them because it is can be a really really important fly in certain streams, particularly spring creeks and tailwaters. So um, thank you all for tuning in. It means a lot to us that you come here and spend uh, Monday afternoons with us. And um, you know, seeing lots of old friends, it seems like we have we have quite a nice group here and uh, no trolls. I don't know. I don't know why we don't have any trolls here, but everybody is so nice, um, which, which we appreciate. Anyway, Thank you all for tuning in. Be here next Monday for another uh, Flagler tie-off. I think I'm due to win. I think I've I've been I've lost badly the past few times, so I'm going to really practice for this one. But I know Flagler's going to practice too. So um, we will see. We will see what happens. But it, uh, regardless, uh, it'll be fun. We'll have a good time and. Um, We'll see you on Monday. Julia, we don't have any other live events this week, do we? Nope, not this week. We uh, finished up Spring Orvis Days, and we're just chugging ahead with awesome Mother's Day content, so be sure to check that out. All right. We'll see you for the tie-off on Monday. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next week. See ya.